Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Furmanek, and thank you for coming to my talk, in which we are going to talk about internals of async. And during this talk, I generally assume you do know what async and await are. You more or less understand how those things work under the hood. What we'll cover today is the internals, how those things are implemented, how they connect multiple parts like TPO, synchronization context, or task, task completion sources under the hood. And we'll do all of that to understand this one very counterintuitive fact about async and await. The fact that there is no thread dedicated to running the task. So throughout this talk, we are going to, we want to understand first how it's possible that even though we have no threads, we can still get the job done. And also how those things work under the hood, how they are connected, how they are related, and how those things are implemented by which parts of the .NET platform, whether it's compiler, whether it's uh, just in time, or whether it's uh, CLR itself. So we are going to walk through a lot of internals to see the the things which allow us to use await in C Sharp. My name is Adam Furmanek, and let's see some internals then. Before we begin, a few words about me. Uh, I was a .NET developer for a few years. Right now, I'm more of a big data machine learning guy at Amazon in Seattle. Uh, I'm also an author of .NET Internals Cookbook. If you are interested in internals of .NET, feel free to take a look at this book, which explains a lot of things. It's structured as a series of questions and answers about various internals. So it's supposed, it's meant to be second. So whatever you just, you have a question, you go there, you see the short answer, and you also have references to various pages or resources on the internet where you can read more. I'm also a blogger. Please take a look at my blog at blog.adamfurmanek.po if you are interested in things which I'm going to show you today or other things about .NET internals or generally Windows and all those things. Uh, also, this, those slides will be available there at the, end of, at the end of this talk. There will be a QR code pointing to the slides or actually to the series on, at my blog with slides. Uh, so feel free to download them. Also, just uh, mention that this talk is actually because we have shorter time slot. This will be only a shorter version of the talk. The slide deck you will find there is the extended one. So you have more demos, more things to learn about. Cool, let's go. Uh, so we want to understand the internals. And actually, whenever we think about async and await, what we typically think is that we need to use tasks. This is not necessarily true, as we will see in a moment. However, task is bread and butter of async and await. So what we need to do initially is we need to go through task details, how this thing is implemented under the hood and how it works. And uh, then after learning about the task, we'll go through synchronization context. We'll see actually the more important part of async and await, which allows us to do this whole synchronous asynchronous interactions. Finally, we will see how state machine is supported by .NET by C Sharp compiler, how those things work under the hood. And after that, we'll actually understand everything about async and await. So then we'll use this knowledge to see some things like how to handle exceptions, how things can break, ultimately how to await async void methods in C Sharp. So let's begin. Uh, so I told you uh, that Task is bread and butter of async and await or async programming in C Sharp. However, task is not required at all. Actually, compiler doesn't need the task to support async and await. And we'll start with very simple demo. So I'm starting this application in which what we are trying to do is we just await the integer. Await 2000 here. What is happening under the hood is compiler does the duct typing similarly as it does with for each loops. What we need to do is the type which we would like to await must be an awaitable type. Awaitable type is something which provides the method get awaiter, which returns something which we can use for awaiting. So it needs to be, it needs to support uh, getting result or telling whether the operation has already finished or not. This is the awaitable type. So what we can see in this demo, what we do here is I just provide an extension method which extends integer and returns just task delay from the integer I am awaiting on. So you can clearly see that first this thing can, does compile and also when we take a look at what is happening here, you can see that I was waiting here for 2000 milliseconds, which is effectively something like here. So when I print the time, you can actually see the delay. So this is actually the first important thing about async and wait. This is not something like very coupled to TPL or to task or all those things. Generally, await is supported by any type which we can make awaitable. And because of extension methods, we can effectively turn any type into awaitable one. So to figure out how this works under the hood, 
Uh, we can see that async underway it works on duck typing and requires a type which returns, uh, which has is completed or is available, is able to give us the result of the of the operation it was executing. That's how it works. That's how it's connected. And we'll actually throughout the this talk see a lot of different away table types which we typically use, and most most of them are not tasks or sometimes even not task related at all. So. This is how it, in generally, is supposed to work. The compiler does not need to know about the task and does not need to explicitly support it. However, the typical way we use async and await is through tasks. So let's see how task is constructed under the hood. And because of some historical reasons, tasks appeared in .NET much earlier than async and await. We had multiple like async programming patterns, like EAP, like some other things. We had this TPL, parallel link, and all those things. And some of them were like contextual, some of them were leading to callback health, all those things. But ultimately, what we now use the most often is the task. And the task is actually a very interesting type because it supports two different logical executions right now. The one which we were using with the, with the link or with TPL library where is task which is supporting the CPU bound operations. Task which actually has something to do. Some calculation or some operation to execute. This task we just create using, uh, in TPL world or, or in plink, we just create them using task factory or task run or all those things. However, since introducing async and await, the task type represents completely different workflow. And this different workflow is based basically on the promise idea. This task represents now not something which needs to be calculated, computed, or executed. It only represents something which will eventually happen. There will be something potentially in the future. There will be something which will happen, a fact which will rely on to continue the execution. And this task is mostly IA-bound, and the thing about it is it's used in async world and it does not need any thread to support this situation. Because this task represents that, like with await delay thingy, with task delay thing we just seen, uh, is situation that, hey, this time has just passed. The task represents that we are in the future so we can safely carry on. This is what the task represents. And in those situations, we have completely different mechanisms to create tasks like this. So we can create task from result or task delay or task yield. We can also create those tasks using like task completion source, which we at some point just mark as completed. And this is, we'll see under the hood how those things can work without supporting any threads. However, the takeaway from this, from this slide is that even though there is one type in the, in the base class library on the, in, the, in the code, this type supports two completely different things. And because the type was reused, the old task type was reused to support async await, we actually need to fit the new async workflow into the world of old async task, or of old task, which was implemented in some way. So let's walk through all those steps of task or the life cycle of the task. So we can see that it has three significant uh, parts. First, we need to create the task somehow. Then we need to, when the task finishes its execution or finishes the calculations or something has happened, we probably want to attach some continuation to the task. So add more work to the task so we can chain operations. Ultimately, everything is done and then it's time for cleaning up. We would need to dispose or clean up the task in general. So let's walk through those steps one by one. Let's see what we need to do with tasks. When it comes to creation, because task is tightly related to the idea of scheduling, we can actually create tasks in two steps. Typically, we avoid it, like splitting those steps. However, in theory, we can create tasks using constructor. This task just represents something to do or something that something will happen. However, this thing is not scheduled at all. The task will not be executed at all. And generally, do not do that. The idea behind doing this was that we may want to capture some code or some logical execution, wrap it with task, and pass it to someone else who can control how this thing is executed. And this thing is controlled by the task scheduler. Typically in our applications, we don't need this separation, so we just go with task run, task factory, start new link, or whatever else to start to create the task and already schedule it and execute it. However, if we were to walk through it, like step by step, whenever we do create a task, the task is not doing anything. What we need to do is we need to schedule and start the task, and what we can see when we decompile the code under the hood, it goes to the task scheduler. 
The task scheduler is a type provided by .NET, which is static. We cannot create like uh, our own task scheduler uh, by instantiating this thingy. It is a bit sophisticated. It supports things like creating uh, like different uh, queues, like work stealing, all those things. However, the idea we need to remember about is that this thing is supposed to take the task and start the execution sometime, somehow, somewhere. We don't need to think where, how, and why, or when. However, this thing will just take care of that. And because we will be picking into internals today and we will be re-implementing parts of the .NET platform to actually await async void, this is how we can implement our own task scheduler easily. So we don't need to support a lot of different various complicated scenarios. The thing we need to do basically is we just create a collection of tasks we would like to execute and we just then execute them one by one. So I don't expect you to remember or memorize this code. Just remember that, hey, we can do our own task scheduler and it's not that sophisticated to do. Okay, so we know how to create a task. We know how to schedule and start it, that it uses some task scheduler provided by .NET. What happens next? The task is doing some work, it executes something, calculates something. Ultimately, we would like to probably change some more operations. And the workhorse of the task type is obviously the continue with method, which we typically use in its normal form, like continue with and we pass a lambda. However, this method is very, actually very powerful. It supports a lot of different scenarios. It, can, it supports like changing the scheduler. It supports long running tasks. We can add continuation only when there was an exception or when something, or when everything succeeded with no failures at all. So generally, this thingy is pretty complicated and can support multiple workflows. However, for us to remember what is important is that continue with just chains things together. So let's now see how those things are chained together. So whenever we call a continue with on the task, what we can see is that it creates a type called standard task continuation. And then we take this continuation and add it to the task we are currently working on with, the, with task at task continuation. So what this continuation is doing, is supposed to do, is this needs to be executed when we finish the previous operation we wanted to run. So at some point, the task supports a method called complete. And this method at some point must be called by something. This could be like internals of task completion source, or this could come from a driver of the operating system notifying us that, hey, file has already been read or something like this. This could come from task delay that, hey, the time has passed. Ultimately, this method is called somehow by some mechanism which we don't necessarily need to know about. So complete is being called, and then we then go through some internals of task, we try set results. What we ultimately do is we end with method called finish continuations. And when we walk through this method, we can see that at the very end, what it does is it goes to task continuation and calls method run. The continuation which we just created previously with this standard task continuation. So now the thing is what this standard task continuation does, and when we decompile it, we can see that it just goes to task and calls schedule and start. And this is the thing which we have already seen. Schedule and start was going to task scheduler, scheduling the task to execute. So we can see that we close the cycle. We do create some task. We, because we call task factory start new or task run or whatever else, we immediately schedule and start the task. So it goes to task scheduler. The task is being queued for execution. Then the task is finished at some point and the complete method is called. It goes to continuation, which we added and then continuation once again for standard task continuation, just calls schedule and start on the task. So this is how we do have this loop to execute those things and we can chain operations one after another. So this is chaining. Now the question is, okay, we did everything we wanted to do. Now the question is, how do we clean up the task or whether we should clean up the task? And the thing is, generally the rule of thumb is do not dispose the task. That's because in .NET 4, whenever you do dispose a task, you cannot use continue with method anymore because resources under the hood are released. So your task is effectively broken if you would like to use it again. However, in .NET, starting in .NET 4.5, the task was a bit optimized, so it doesn't allocate resources unless they are like needed uh, and they cannot be avoided. But for most of the use cases, they are not needed, so we don't need to allocate them. So the dispose method does not need to do anything. There is nothing to release, nothing to dispose. So generally, don't bother cleaning your tasks because in .NET 4, it may break them. In .NET 4.5, this is like a no-op. It doesn't change anything. 
Also, it is worth mentioning here that uh, task is a type which is allocated on the heap. It's a class. So it needs to be garbage collected. If we do create a lot of tasks, and this is something we do with async and await because we do create a lot of tasks, those will be garbage, uh, those will be allocated on the heap and needs to be cleaned up at some point. Because of that, actually what .NET wanted to optimize is to allocate tasks on the stack instead of the heap to avoid going through garbage collector to get rid of them. So this is why value task type was introduced and this is a structure which is actually stored on the stack. The thing is I highly recommend going through the series by Joe Duffy about the Midori operating system in which actually the whole operating system was based on async and await methods. How the, let's say, Win API or Midori API was async and await so you had a lot of tasks over there and that's why they they had to be uh, like highly optimized to avoid allocations and all those things uh, Joe Duffy also mentioned at some point that it like it's con he considers this a big mistake that task in dotnet is not a structure but is a class so this is something we may want to uh, I recommend reading about it's pretty interesting lecture also when it comes to value tasks, I highly recommend going to Konrad Kokosa GitHub account, where he shows how to create a pooled value task source to decrease the allocation even more. So if we want to write highly optimized like C-sharp or .NET code, I recommend taking a look at this because this allows us to like get uh, even more, less allocation uh, if needed. Okay, so that was the task. And typically we think, hey, task is all we need for async and await. And generally, it's just the beginning. The more important thing in async and await world is synchronization context, because it's all about the synchronization context. So why is, what is that? Why it's important? Before we had synchronization context, we always had this need, this notion of, hey, I want to get something, get some code, and execute it somewhere, somehow. Starting with .NET 1, we always had this need that, hey, we do some background calculations, we would like to update the UI. We do something on a separate, let's say, thread, we would like to update something somewhere else. We always want to have this Lambda, this event handler, this, we want to react when something finishes. And that's why since the very beginning, we had a thing called Isynchronize Invoke, which was actually capable of taking some Lambda, running it somewhere else. However, the problem with Isynchronize Invoke, or like the drawback of this approach was that it was connected or tied to the thread idea. So we always had this thread isynchronize invoke was working on top of the thread. So whenever we were trying to run something using this synchronize invoke, it always had to go through this thread. But this is not what we want. What we want to do is, hey, I am finishing my calculations. I don't care whether I am I'm on a UI thread or somewhere else. Just get this Lambda, execute it some, for me at some point somewhere somehow. I don't necessarily care how and when, just make it working, just do it. So this is how synchronization context emerged. And because synchronization context is just about synchronizing things, this is not the only thing we need to think about. Because like the code which we want to execute doesn't live on its own. It needs to support permissions, it needs to support, uh, support impersonation, it probably has some like thread locals or async locals or other things. Generally there is a lot around the code just to execute the code. And that's why the type code execution context was introduced. This is basically a bug supporting different things of the execution, like permissions, like security, like allocation, like all those things which need to be cared with the code we are executing potentially somewhere else, potentially on different thread in different context. So this is execution context, and one of the contexts it has in it is the synchronization context. And this is like the general abstraction which we can use to realize what we want to do. That, hey, I do have some code. I would like to get it working somehow, somewhere, sometime. I don't necessarily need to think about that. Synchronization context doesn't tell us anything about when this is executed, how this is executed, whether this is executed on the same thread or different thread, whether this goes in parallel or serially, whether this actually executes using like the infrastructure we provide or not. Synchronization context just give us this thing that, hey, I do want to execute this at some point. And because synchronization context is just an abstraction, there are multiple implementations of that. And why is this relevant for async and await? Is because the first sentence of this slide is probably the, mo the most important for us during this whole talk. When awaiting the await table type, the current context is captured. 
And because synchronization context is like a global variable, we need to make sure or at least understand what is the current value of the synchronization context we are executing the code. Because depending on the synchronization context, we get completely different behavior. For instance, let's go and see some examples of synchronization context. Depending on the type of application we execute, we do have different implementations because we have different goals. In UI applications, name it WinForms, WPF, WinRT, whatever else, what we want to take care about is there is just one thread which is allowed to modify the UI. The UI thread which created the controls is the only thread which can safely modify them. So whenever we want to execute something, we actually need to go through that single thread because, hey, this is the only way to safely modify the UI. However, in web applications, we don't necessarily care about the thread we execute on. What we care about is the request context we are working on currently. So there is some HTTP request or whatever web request we are processing. Whenever we switch threads, whenever we move to the continuation or something else, we always would like to have exactly the same web requests which we are processing. So this is what we need to take care of. We don't need to work on the same thread constantly. However, we want to be working with the same request request context constantly. However, for instance, for console-based applications, we generally don't care. There is nothing like requiring special interaction or special handling. So in default or, or console-based applications, we do not have the synchronization context at all. We just go through the thread pool, which is using the, the normal threads provided by .NET. So this is actually interesting thing because if you do migrate ASP.NET applications to ASP.NET Core, you actually change the concurrency or parallelism of your applications. Why is that? Because ASP.NET, the old one, it was using the special synchronization context to support the HTTP request. However, this synchronization context is not used in ASP.NET Core anymore. So we don't go through the same logic. Now the thing is, in ASP.NET, there was only one execution or only one continuation allowed to execute at the same time in given HTTP request, meaning that when you scheduled multiple continuations, only one of them could be executing at the same time, so they were executed one by one. However, in ASP.NET Core, because we don't have synchronization context, this requirement is gone. Continuations may execute in parallel, so if you just blindly migrate the applications, you may change the concurrency logic. So why is this important? The thing is important because those two things are connected to support the async and await. What we would like to see right now is how state machine is implemented under the hood and how synchronization context and task, how they are connected together. So what we want to do is we will start with this very simple, with this very simple code. What we do have here is we do have static void main, which the only thing it does is calls the async uh, method and calls wait on it. And then in our async method, which we will dissect through the next couple of minutes, we actually have four important parts, all of them separated with different await calls. So first part is we do, do something and then call await task from result, which is supposed to finish immediately because from result should be already available. Then we do task delay, which is supposed to wait for some time. Then we do task yield, which is always supposed to do the context switch for our execution. And at the very end, we just do the throw new exception. So you can see that this whole method has something like 15 lines of code, so it's not long. However, when we do compile it and decompile it, this is what we get. So if you do the compile the whole type, it's roughly 130 lines of code. So let's see how this thing is implemented under the hood and what is done by the compiler to support async and await. So first thing we would like to see is that actually after compilation, async is completely gone. So async is not something supposed by the, supposed by the CLR or supposed by the just-in-time compiler or by the .NET platform. It's just a compiler, C-sharp compiler trick, meaning that the same thing we can implement in any other language which would be running on top of .NET. And also this pattern is like generally used in different technologies as well. For instance, in JavaScript, they will fit await logic. So the first thing is async disappears and also what we have here is we do create some sophisticated type with some 
who like quite interesting name, which is our async method d underscore underscore. This thing, what it does, it's we call this a state machine, which will actually hold all the metadata or all the actual pieces of information we need to keep during the execution of async and await method. So what we do, the, what we do here is we do create this type, we set builder, we set some state to minus one, we'll get to that in a second. And the important thing here is we just call the start method. So we do have some type and we call start method on it. And whenever this method finishes, we just immediately return the task. So this is what we do. Let's see how these things are implemented then. So the type which we create under the hood actually creates those fields. So first field is the integer state. Because we started with a method which had four logical parts of execution, like separated with different three different awaits, this state will indicate in which part we are currently working on. Then we do have this builder, which is like a type used by the c -sharp compiler to do the magic, do the plumbing. And then we can see that we have three different task awaiters. We had three awaits in our method, so that makes three awaiters. First is task awaiter for Boolean, which is for task from result where we were returning false. Then is task awaiter with no generic type because we were just doing task delay. And then we do have yield awaitable dot yield awaiter. So you can see that we did something like task yield, which is connected to task. However, this thing does not work on any task type. So this is how we do create these awaiters. And let's now see how those things are kicked off. So coming back to this code, we can see that state is initialized to minus one and we call method start. So when we do execute the start method, what it does under the hood, it goes to the state machine, so the type we just allocated, and calls move next method. And this move next method is the whole workhorse of our method which we are executing. So the move next, in general, starts with very simple thing. We just capture the state which was there, this integer which we initialized to minus one, and then we do enter try catch block. So you can clearly see now that if you do throw something from async method, it's immediately captured by the try catch logic inside there, which was created, which wasn't there for you, like written by you. So we can see that exceptions are not propagated just like that. We'll get to that, how those are propagated. The important thing here is whenever exception happens, it's just set on the builder and then wired through the task. So enter, let's enter the try thing and let's see what we do here. When we dissect the task, uh, the, the, the try block, initially what it does is it enters the switch block and the, continues the execution depending on the state which we captured. So we did initialize state to minus, now, minus one, now we do switch minus one, and depending on the labels, we go to some different part of the code, and those numbers I, I written here are related to the four logical parts of method. So if you were to see where this first part is executed, it's actually this case one, and also this default. So let's start and let's go through this method line by line what we do there. So we enter this method. The first thing we wanted to do is the part before task from result. So we enter switch, we do switch minus one, and we can see that there is now a switch we could use. So we just enter this default block because there is no case for minus one. What we do here is we can see there is console write line where we print out, and then we just get the awaiter from result, and we check whether it's completed. The thing here is task from result is supposed to be completed immediately, because that's the goal of task from result. The result is just available. So we do not enter this if condition, we just go to break here, and then at the very end, we just call awaiter get result. And because awaiter get result is supposed to get the result from the task, we can see that, hey, task from result already returns a value. So first thing to note here is, even though we did have a wait, we actually didn't stop the execution. The thing we are executing now goes synchronously on the thread which triggered the operation. Async does not change anything in this area. So if you don't have await, or if you await operations which are already, com already completed, nothing changes here. So this is the first part. So we can see that our state is minus one and we finished in line 72. We then continue in line 73 to print things again and to get the awaiter. And now we check whether the awaiter is completed. And because we called await task delay some value, this is not supposed to be completed immediately because, hey, we just want to sleep for a while. So most likely this is not completed yet. What we do here is we do some bookkeeping. bookkeeping. We change the state to one and then we call builder await unsafe uncompleted 
And the then important thing is we return from this method immediately. What this await on save on completed does is when we start decompiling this, it gets the completion action and then call aw calls await, uh, awaiter on save on completed. And this completion action, what it does is it has the name move next runner. We have already seen a method move next. We already suspect this move next runner is probably supposed to run that move next method. However, we do create it and then we do once await on save on completed. This thing at some point will be executed and we can see that this thing, yes, indeed, it gets the state machine and calls the move next. The move next method, which we just started the execution. So how this work under the hood is, we do create this awaiter, which will continue thing, and then we set continuation for await on the task object. So we are already back to the task world, and we know what is going to happen now. At some point, something comes in, calls complete on the task, Continuations are executed. Now the thing is, how is this continuation executed in this context? And whenever we do set the continuation, we actually see the whole magic about synchronization context on this slide. So you can see that we check whether we do have synchronization context and we capture it. If we don't have the one synchronization context, we just call, uh, we just get the task scheduler and ultimately add the task continuation. So this is the continuation which will be executed and this continuation action at the very end, it gets the callback and if we go through context, away table, whatever type name there is, long names here, we just see that we go through synchronization context and calls post map. So now we see another loop, another cycle of this task world. So what is happening? We do await something, we capture the continuation as a lambda, we build runner, which is supposed to run the move next method, the method where we started. So this runner is now wired as a continuation to task. Something comes at some point, there is no threat, there is a driver or there is task completion source or whatever else, something comes in and calls complete on the task. Task then, we have already seen, goes to execute the continuations and this continuation, as we can see here, is going through the synchronization context to schedule the job to do. So this is how those two words are related. So we can see that whenever we await something, we capture the context and then we pass the continuation through it. So now what is happening is the continuation in our case is just move next runner. So we continue back here and because we were waiting for task delayed, we just added this continuation and we return. At this point, we stop executing the move next method and we just return the task as we have seen on one of the previous slides. This is it. Then something comes in, calls the task, and the task, this continuation magic, starts executing the task, the move next method again, and in this, in this time, we enter the switch, this switch again, because we are executing exactly the same code from the very beginning. Because now our state is set to one, because this is the bookkeeping we have done before exiting the method, we just enter this case. And in this situation, we just get the awaiter from the fields we have stored previously, and we jump to ILFA instruction, and ILFA instruction is here at the very end, so we exit the switch, we jump at the end of this code, pass the things which we have already executed, we call get result, and now the, the task is already supposed to be finished, because hey, that's, that was the goal. So this is how those things do stop the execution of the method, and then later at some point they just return and continue executing from the same place where we wanted, where we stopped previously. So okay, let's see the first part of this method. Now it's getting very easy because the thing just repeats itself. We again print something, we get the awaiter, we check whether it's completed, it is not, so we get the await on save and completed for the action and we return. Because this time it was task yield, the difference with task yield is it always goes through synchronization context no matter whether with the operation like finished or not because it's always supposed to go through the context switch, so it just goes to synchronization context or if there is none, it goes to task schedule and all those things. And at the very end, we return to the move next method again, and we can see the last part which we are executing is just throwing the exception. So we throw a new exception, and this new exception is immediately handled here. So it's not propagated at all. So whenever you call async method, exceptions do not leave this method. They are handled here. So that was the state machine. 
And now the thing is how those things can cause issues on our side. What problems we can get when we do work with, uh, with uh, those async await logic. So let's see some deadlocks. And the thing is, because there is no thread which is actively waiting on the async and await, in theory, we should not have deadlocks because like why we don't, we have just one thread. However, there is some logic which is supposed to call complete at some point and we must synchronize the execution. So it's still possible to get the, the deadlock even though we just use the thread which triggered the operation. And the rule of thumb here and the most important sentence of this talk is use async all the way up. Never ever wait for Away for tasks using synchronous dot wait method because you will run into deadlocks pretty quickly. So let's see why we get deadlocks and how to fix them by doing some dirty hacks under the hood. So the general idea with capturing and passing synchronization context is we start here, let's dissect some simple code. So we do await some processing data async and here we are on UI thread because this is some UI uh, application like WinForms. We do await process data async. Because we have already seen this thing is executed synchronously. So we enter the process data async and what we do here is we enter the await download, uh, the, the process data async, we call await download async and we probably know that we can configure whether we capture the synchronization context or not using this thingy configure await here. So we do start executing this method synchronously. And the thing is with download async, we have no idea whether it finishes synchronously or not. Because, hey, maybe the data is already there provided by in-memory cache, right? So there does not need to be any context switch or, or something like this. So we don't know where we are, but we don't want to capture the synchronization context. So either what happens now is this download async finished synchronously and we are here on the UI thread again, or it had to go through context switch. And because we did not capture the, the synchronization context, this thing is starting from here, this whole continuation, is executed using the thread pool. So it goes through the task scheduler to thread pool, et cetera, runs on some different thread. We process the data, we return the data again. What we then do is when we finish executing this method, we would like to execute this continuation here. And because here at this point, we did capture a continuation context, this thing is routed through that one, so it goes to the UI thread. So the last line of download button click method is executed on the UI thread again because, hey, we captured the synchronization context. And while this seems easy, how we pass, we can quick control how we store or capture the synchronization context, let's see why it's easy to cause a deadlock with the same code working in one application and not working in another. So let's see some console application. So what we do is we call operation on context and we call synchronous wait, something we should never be doing. Synchronization, this uh, synchronous method just calls await task delay. At some point, we would like to execute this continuation here. And because this is console application, we have no synchronization context. We go to the thread pool. Even though the original thread is blocked here at this wait line, we do have some more threads in the thread pool. So we have some, some mechanism to execute the code. We do finish the continuation, it works. No deadlock here. What happens if we move on to WinForms application with seemingly the same code? So we again code the method operation on context.wait and we do await task delay. Now what happens? This continuation is supposed to be executed somewhere. We capture synchronization context, so we post this continuation onto it. Synchronization context in WinForms applications and generally in UI applications, what it does is it wants to go to the UI thread. UI thread is blocked here in wait. So we are generally stuck in this place, the thread is waiting, and the continuation has no way to be executed. We cannot execute the continuation at all, so effectively this method never finishes and dot wait never returns. So this is why we do have deadlock. How to solve this issue? Super easy, we have already seen this. So the, the idea is, let's just not capture the synchronization context. What we do now is this continuation here wants to execute somewhere, there is no synchronization context, it goes to the thread pool, it executes on some other thread, ultimately operation on thread pool finishes, dot wait returns, we are good, there is no deadlock here. But it's not that easy generally, because we never know 
what the continuation or what the method wants to do in general. And imagine that this continuation wants to go through invoke, saying that, hey, I would like to modify the UI, change the control state, modify the text box, whatever else. This thing now, invoke, wants to get to the UI thread, which is once again stuck in this dot .wait method. So generally, calling dot .wait in any UI application is not a good idea. Now the question is, how can we hack this to make it working? And the trick for doing that is, instead of doing uh, like dot .wait method, there is simple hack to, to solve this, because what we need to do is we just want to hijack the operation as it was posted through the synchronization context, and this method, this operation goes to the message loop, so we just need to execute the message loop here and process all the messages. So we can sleep for a millisecond, run the messages, sleep for me a second, well, run the messages. At some point, this comes as a message to, the, to, the, to our message pump. We capture the message, we execute it, and then this method can safely finish, and here at some point we will see that task was completed. So this is nice hack how to do it. Obviously, we should not be doing that. Obviously, we never call dot .wait, but in case we do, this is how to solve it. But the things get more interesting when we do notice that, hey, synchronization context is a global variable. When we do execute unit tests like this, when we do await task delay here, this thing never finishes. It like gets stuck forever. Why is that? Because we do create new form, which is Windows WinForms uh, form. What it does, it goes through some logic to check, hey, is WinForms initialized properly? If it's not, hey, I do replace the synchronization context as a global variable. So at this point, because we started with no synchronization context, after creating this form, we have WinForm synchronization context, and we do get a deadlock immediately. Why? Because the runner waits on different synchronization context and is not aware that this thing has finished. How to solve this? If we need to do it by any chance, we can just capture the current synchronization context, create the new form, and restore the original synchronization context. So we, switch, we change this global variable, we replace the context, and then at some point this await task delay now works correctly because an unit follows the synchronization context we had previously. So this is how to hack it again. When it comes to exception handling, generally I showed you that there is try-catch block, and let's, let's now see how those things are propagated under the hood. So we do have some exception in async thingy, uh, and what we do here is we do execute a method which is async void, and this method just waits for some time and throws the exception. So we just call this method here. We are, we are in try-catch block, and what we are doing here, we would like to handle this exception. However, this does not work, or actually it worked. Now do I have exception incorrect thingy? Yeah, it crashed. The thing is, actually, that was the point I'm, I was going to make. This thing does not work reliably. Sometimes it crashes, sometimes it does not. The thing is, whenever we do call this, this exception here is propagated in some code out of band matter. So it's executed or thrown from different threads. We don't know when, we don't know how, and we cannot conduit it with try catch. And the thing here is, you can see that this thread was sleeping for 900 milliseconds and then printing done, and this done was printed out here. So it seemed that even though the exception was propagated, it was working uh, correctly. It didn't crash the application. But let's now introduce the thread sleep here. Now the thing is this, this throw finishes before we exit the try-catch block. We still cannot handle the exception, but now when we take a look at this method, we do see that this done was not printed at all. So just introducing random delay into the method or into the execution changes the behavior of exceptions. So handling async void is a bit, a bit tricky, and generally we cannot do it reliably just like this. But the thing is different when we do async task instead of async void. Now we can see compiler tells us, hey, you should await these things, and that's because if we don't await them, the exception is not propagated at all. It's lost. We cannot retrieve the exception just like this, but our application does not crash. The thing is, can we somehow get this exception back? And the answer for that is yes, because what we need to do is we need to use the so-called unobserved task exception thingy. So whenever garbage collector realizes that some task is being cleaned up, 
it calls the unobserved task exception handler, which we can use to react to the exceptions which were not handled correctly from the tasks. So what I do here, I call method test. I would then wait in read line. And here I am waiting. You can see there is nothing printed out. Nothing happens. But the method has already finished. If I now press enter here, you can see that I am calling GC to clean up all the memory. My handler is being executed. And I do get this unobserved exception back. So I can retrieve this exception. Exception, I can print it out, but I cannot handle it easily. The rule of thumb is always await the tasks. And because we always want to await the task, we actually should not be using async void because async void does not return the task for us. So those are exceptions uh, in like general when it comes to, to async and await. And now let's see how we actually can await the async void method. Obviously, we should never use methods like this. Sometimes we are forced to do so, depending on what language we use or what interop we do or what library we use for UI thingies. But generally, we should never use these things. But if we need to do, I click something like interactive thingy, which will take some time. OK, let's run this application uh, under the hood. And let's see what this thing thinks is doing. So what we do is we do call the, we do have throw method. This throw method is just printing out something, waiting for a second throwing the exception. It's async void. We would like to handle this, this void method, this async void method somehow. How do we do that? We already learned how to reimplement things, and what we need to do is we need to reimplement two parts of .NET. First, we go with our custom scheduler in which we just create collection of tasks. This is something which we have already seen, yes? We just want to have this scheduler so we can get the tasks post posted to this scheduler. And the second thing is we implement our own synchronization context, which uses custom task factory. The thing here is we do hide the default scheduler provided by .NET, and then we provide our own scheduler, which scheduler is my task scheduler, which will be used to handle all the continuations. So at some point with async await, the continuation goes through post method in our synchronization context, and in this post, we just use our custom factory to handle this continuation, and we just schedule it on the task, right? Then we also count the operations so we know when we are done with all the continuations. And then we provide useful method called run, which what it does is it creates a new task to run on somewhere else. It could be new thread. We create our own synchronization context and replace it on the thread which we are executing on. We do create our factory, and then we get all the tasks from our task scheduler, and we execute them one by one with for each. At some point, we finish all the continuations, all the tasks, and what we do is we just get results here. If there was an exception propagated, this is perfectly fine because this exception is now being executed as normal task, so it's handled correctly. And ultimately, we just return this task. So now we do have something which we can await. So instead of calling just throw, we need to wrap it with, wrap it with our myContext.run method. And we do have the task which we can wait. So here we could either do wait or await this, this uh, task or whatever else. To have the same exception semantic, we do get awaiter.get result to avoid going through aggregated exceptions. But generally, we can just handle those things. And at the very end, we can just print done, which we can see we are done. And we do have all the exception printed out. So this is how we can await async void methods. Obviously, this is not something we would like to do. But sometimes, if we absolutely need to, there is a way to do so. Summary of the stock. Generally, know your synchronization context. It's actually more important than the task in async await world. Do not use async void, never. If you are forced to, like, don't, but sometimes if you do need to do, I showed you some hacks how to like deal with those. Have async all the way up, never call dot wait, and generally handle all the exceptions. Always await your tasks, always add unobserved task handler exception, avoid creating threads and all those things, just do the right thing, which is async all the way, uh, all the way up, not synchronous blocking, all those things. And having said that, it's time for Q&A. This QR code points to the, my blog post where you can download the slide deck. Now, if you do have questions, raise your hands, please. OK, there is one question.
Uh, hi, thanks uh, for the great call. Uh, I wanted to like elaborate on an observed task exception and actually how what is the best practice to handle like safe fire and forget. I've seen numerous implementations and I wasn't sure which why which one is quite right. Meaning, uh, I've mm -hmm. done some measurements and uh, it, it did allocate a lot of memory when I had a lot of task throwing exceptions. Uh, they were cleaned up eventually, but it could actually eat like 8, 16 gigabytes of memory if I rendered this long enough. Uh, is there some way how to force uh, the collection of these objects sooner rather than later? Uh, okay, so there are two questions here actually. How do ha how do, do fire and forget and still handle exceptions? My recommendation would be to just add continuation with continue with to always react on failure, all those things. This is how you can handle that. Now the question is how to decrease the memory allocation. It depends what you actually do. If you do need to do some clear cleaning up, continue with probably could like mitigate that. If the problem is you have too many tasks which are actually stuck there waiting, you may want to go with value task. However, the problem may be that you are actually executing those tasks in like uh, too slow to, to handle the things correctly. In that case, you may be actually having problems with task scheduler, which is using two types of queues, global queues and local queues. And then you may have like a lock convoying all those things. So generally, this is not something I can answer quickly without referring to specific implementation. My idea would be definitely to figure out first what is allocated, what is leaked. If you would like to force the memory deallocation, I don't think this is the way to go. GC should handle that on its own. You should not be forcing that. So if you do run into memory issues, that the probably problem lies somewhere else. Like you have problems with task scheduler or thread pulling, all those things. Uh, so to sum up this thingy, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, generally, more analysis would be required here to figure out what's there. But the thing, first thing to start is continue with and clear up the things after the, the whole chain is done. This probably could mitigate at least some of the things. Cool. Any other questions? There is one. Okay, I know you told don't use task weight and task result and these things, but uh, in ASP.NET application, is there any way how to use them safely? Because I have an old code which relies on thread local and all these things. So I really, really, really need to return to the same thread after I'm done with my asynchronous part. And uh, weight seems to be the only way how to do it. Got it. Uh, how to do it? Uh, like, we obviously never have problems like this, and that's how I, why I figured out those hacks. I haven't had problem like this in ASP.NET application. Uh, probably you could go with tricks like overriding your synchronization context the way I did, or doing some hacks like for the WinForms application. Uh, generally, what I would do is I would run everything on task run and route my continuations through my own uh, concurrency logic, through my own scheduler or factory or whatever else. And then at some point, uh, I would just use time completion source and on that task, task returned by task completion source, I would wait. Uh, yes, I am saying you should never be calling dot wait, but obviously if this is what you need to do, then you just call dot wait. The only thing is to figure out whether something in between wants to get on the thread because then your thread is blocked and you need to handle that. So it may be that you cannot call dot wait like explicitly, but you need to, for instance, wait on some queue on which you will be putting continuations and running them manually. This depends again on the use case you have. Uh, so while I said you should not be doing this, this is like the way to go. Just have some queue and communicate. But you need to re-implement part of .NET effectively to do the interfret communications for doing this thing. So, so yes, if you need to do it, it is doable most likely, but probably not nice as we have seen. Any other questions? Cool, if there are other questions, I can take them offline. I'll be here around, so feel free to ask. And just to wrap up some references for you, those are in the slide deck as well. So if you would like to read something about .NET internals, I recommend you start with books like here. I uh, highly recommend reading .NET internals cookbook. I also recommend going with like concurrency books by Joe Duffy or other things like that. If you are interested in internals in general and would like to read in this about this like uh, on the internet, there is 
fantastic blog, The Old New Thing by Raymond Chen. If you are interested in memory dumps, architectures, locking, interpreting scenarios, all those things are truly amazing to do. So The Old New Thing I recommend. If you are interested in the things I have shown you today, you can read about them on my blog. So here are some links to my blog. If you would like to read about those things, but outside of my blog, here are some more links which you can use to start your journey about async await, synchronization context, and all those things. And having said all of that, I think it's time to wrap up. So my name is Adam Furmanek, and I'd like to thank you for attending this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.